these venerable columns, this verdant roof, these fair ranks of trees, massy and tall and dark. This mighty oak by whose immovable stem I stand and seem almost annihilated, not a prince. For over 300 years, these woods have been a landmark of America. Oaks and maples, elms and evergreens were all part of an ancient forest that stretched as far as the eye could see. To untold millions who emigrated here, the wildness offered refuge and freedom. It was unfettered ground, a place to build, to play, to meditate. Nature in America was as important as any monument in Europe. But today these woods face an uncertain future. We tend to think of deforestation as something that's going on in, in tropical countries. But uh, around our cities, we're doing a lot of uh, deforestation. It never occurred to anybody that the cities were a forest of a type and that that forest ought to be cared for and paid attention to. It's a dynamic forest. It's composed of trees that are dying, growing, constantly being regenerated by people. And it's a forest that is really essential to our well-being quality of our life. It affects air, water, the very climate of our cities. This is the forest where we live. Around our cities today, trees must contend with urbanization on a scale unknown before. It's affecting land from the downtown of American cities to the edge of suburbs. This is the nation's urban forest, some 70 million acres, an area more vast than any of our national forests. About 2,400 acres per day is being converted from rural to urban land use. Um, so for every acre, there are 20 to 30 trees that um, all of a sudden part of the urban forest. Or we're protecting trees that were in forests and now are surrounded by buildings and shopping centers. In recent years, America has witnessed an explosion of population and economic activity. And it has come with a price. In too many cities, the space for trees doesn't exist. Growing conditions are poor. Urban soils are often little more than construction rubble. Areas for planting are becoming smaller and smaller. Cities still lose more trees than they plant. That's the biggest crisis that cities have with trees, is they're simply losing them and they have no place to put them back. Americans' relationship with nature has been a wavering one since settlers first came here. Debates over the environment have happened before, notably in the conservation movement that swept the country in the 19th century. But I think it's safe to say that nature was overwhelming to the Europeans who came here. Uh, it was threatening, and the importance of their survival as a society depended on taming it. And the importance of personal success depended very specifically on cutting the trees back so one could farm. In the mid-19th century, rapid industrialization led to extensive deforestation and worsening urban conditions. Forest fires took their toll each year. What wasn't burned was harvested at an alarming rate. The Industrial Revolution revolutionized the American relationship with nature. That's very clear. For the first time, large numbers of Americans were living most of their lives separated from the natural world in the sense that earlier generations had known it. 
Most of the forests on the east coast were gone, and those in the west were under siege. There were some who warned of overdevelopment. One was George Perkins Marsh, a 19th century Vermont congressman. Even now we are breaking up the floor of our world, he said disrupting the invisible bonds that link all the myriad forms of life. And he said, the destruction of woods was man's first violation, for the woods served to protect the earth. For the most part, Americans, I think, still felt that the way towards progress, which was the great 19th century word and was the emblem of Americans' aspirations, progress still meant cutting back the forests. It still meant making room for what they thought of as civilization. Soon, there was equal concern for the cities. Streets, sidewalks, houses. Uh, so many people, so many needs for housing, they didn't leave open space as a matter of course. And it wasn't part of the planning. Block after block after block, just eating up land. Finally, some began to seek solutions. One of the first took place in 1858 with the creation of New York City's Central Park. The man behind it was landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. He was the first person who really made a strong intellectual case for the importance of wild scenery, parklands, and beautiful places within cities that could refresh the body and the mind and the spirit. So they just captured land in the nick of time. And you can imagine what, what, what Manhattan would be like if they had not done that. These cities would be unlivable without these huge parks. By the 1870s, a movement to preserve American forests came of age. The US Forest Service was founded. The first Arbor Day was observed. Between 1905 and 1907, Theodore Roosevelt established 180 million acres of land for wildlife refuges and national parks for the United States. Four years later, he established forests in the east, acquiring lands for watershed protection. Advocates of forest preservation arose. Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the Forest Service. John Muir, a passionate defender of wilderness. Aldo Leopold, who called for a land ethic. They represented the culmination of 60 years of conservationism and environmental awareness that had evolved throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. But if anything had been learned in one century, it appears to have been lost in the next. After World War II, the American landscape was again suffering radical change. Following World War II, the automobile became widely, much more widely available. Uh, and people bought them, and uh, people uh, had higher incomes after the war. And they wanted to move out of the cities into the countryside. We weren't living in apartments or row houses. We wanted our own little piece of uh, suburbia, a quarter acre or a half acre or whatever. And then disaster hit. Dutch elm disease, and later infestation by gypsy moths, spread throughout the land. The urban forests were more fragile than anyone had understood. The Dutch elm disease was brought in from Europe, and it spread like wildfire through these trees. Dutch elm disease was working its way east to west across the country. There was no cure. They just had to tag infected trees and get them removed. It's one thing when you lose the tree outside your home, but it's another thing when you lose the trees along a whole street. They no longer had shaded streets. They no longer had tree-covered roadways. They now had clear-cut communities. And uh, people took them for granted. When they died, they didn't take them for granted anymore. Dutch elm disease made people realize how much they miss trees. We don't realize how 
important a part of our lives trees are until they're gone. Dutch elm disease marked the beginning of the modern urban forestry movement. And so the environmental movement started in the 60s and, and expressed, itself, expressed itself particularly in the 70s. A lot of uh, legislation passed. People in cities became much more interested in nature. The interest in gardening, the interest in camping, backpacking, a whole host of outdoor activities dramatically increased. And along with that, uh, people were interested in making their communities better places to live. And my fellow citizens. But the Reagan administration challenged these developments. Day has been Funds for urban forestry were cut. Political support had to be raised. It came in 1990 under the Bush administration. Here or any place else, how crucial a strong agricultural sector is to the future of this country. We put together legislation. I was staff on the House Agriculture Committee then and uh, drafted the legislation uh, that was called the Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Act. It became known as the Farm Bill. Funds for urban forestry expanded 20-fold. A network of federal and state organizations was established dedicated to community and urban forestry. The importance of the Farm Bill was that it sets up urban forestry funding at the federal level in a way that we can pipe it to uh, every community. It really created a, a real resurgence in urban forestry because people saw this was great attention at the federal level and um, I think it, it caused many others to, uh, to respond in kind. It really created a new era in urban forestry, like a higher plateau than it had been before. A very significant event. Others saw the Farm Bill as a step in the right direction, but they remained concerned that the real threat to American forests was not being addressed. All around the country there have been some plantings done, but the overall effect um, has not changed the entire way people do development. It hadn't gotten down to the public works crews, the information's not out there. What has been hard, say scientists working in the field, has been persuading policymakers and city planners that the urban forest is important. In the past, city forests were not considered worth study. They were not even thought to be natural. The forestry community overall is always focused on rural areas. They focused on national forests and, and natural resources that tend to be outside uh, city limits. Would you rather be, you know, doing research in Lake Tahoe or in a Walgreen, Walmart parking lot, for example? It's, and, and that's where, so much of the funding, much of the support, and much of the emphasis in gaining new knowledge about ecosystems is directed towards, towards non-urban environments. Today, scientists are redefining the way we look at forests within cities. It's important to, to see the city not as just a set of artificial buildings and impervious surfaces, but as uh, having an infrastructure or, or a, a, a circulatory system weaved through it uh, of live uh, material. About a five foot diameter and about a hundred foot span on the canopy. Years it's a vibrant, uh, uh, renewable uh, resource that unfortunately we take for granted as we walk through the city, but it's, it's critical to the life within the city. If we look at it as a rich tapestry of dynamic processes and interacting uh, components, if we're going to just look at it as a set of street trees or as single elements, uh, we're just not going to comprehend it. Throughout America, cities have been expanding at a colossal rate. Land use controls, and, and quite rightly so, uh, traditionally were local in nature. I mean, the, the town meeting decided whether someone could add a, uh, a new roof to their house in, in, in New Hampshire or whatever. Uh, now that we're dealing with huge systems, we're no longer dealing with individual decisions. We're dealing with uh, massive highways, massive shopping center developments, massive power developments. The local government becomes, in many cases, obsolete. About 
80% of Americans at this point are living in uh, metropolitan areas. Over half of those, about 53%, are living in metropolitan areas that already are above one million people. So we're a very urban nation. Today, the central cities are not where most Americans are locating. It's not where most of the development activity is taking place. Most of it is taking place in the suburbs. As jobs have moved to the perimeter, the so-called edge uh, uh, city phenomenon, people will go even farther out. And we tend to get this uh, flight from the city, but it becomes an absolute mob flight when the uh, jobs go out the corridors, chewing up land, and in a very uneconomic way, because it's, it, the uh, corridors are, are not compact, and they cut down trees, they demand sewer and other services. They move in ever-widening rings of development that often leave the inner rings vacant and empty. Or there are vast corridors of growth. There are some very rapid growth areas, even without the population growth, such as uh, Howard County between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Suburbanization has moved people out of the inner city, even in relatively stagnant overall metropolitan areas, and, and more into suburbs, and thus more land gets consumed in the process. That is the real crisis, is trying to slow down that trend before that whole pattern of land use becomes so implanted that there's nothing we can do about it. New voices have risen, warning of a silent crisis, a specter hovering over the land. The vast American countryside, the fountainhead of national myth, memory, and identity, is vanishing. Uh, Americans have not been willing to accept uh, even the most modest restraints on growth. It's been this uh, frontier uh, and old English law that I can do anything on my land uh, from the sky to the center of the earth. And politically, it's been absolute murder to try to touch it. We can't simply make it a matter of property. There are these larger issues of health, and spirit and imagination that are directly affected by the landscapes that we live in and create and that in turn create us. And that's at least as much true in a city as in the countryside. Despite its reputation as a city and a forest, Atlanta ranks last among major American cities for the number of trees shading its streets. Built surfaces have rapidly replaced the city's natural landscape. We're losing tremendous amounts of forest. We have so many more cars in Atlanta than we used to. We have so many more people. So many things are happening. At the same time, we're losing our forest. Citizens became concerned that so much forest cover was lost from land development. And, and so I think the emphasis, at least here in the metropolitan region, uh, the focus is really the loss of tree cover as part of the overall land development uh, process, and rather than uh, the care of public trees on public lands. Development had been consuming 50,000 trees a year, but it took satellite photographs to reveal the full extent of deforestation. Atlanta is one of those cities that has grown rapidly. Uh, it's sprawled out over the last 20 years, and we're able to measure that change first using geographic information systems so we can see the change in land cover. The Landsat satellites have been circling the Earth for over 20 years, so you can look at, a, at an image from 1972 and all the years in between and find out how the landscape has changed. Everything has to come with a balance. And I know, for example, here in Atlanta, uh, we are experiencing a cost. Atlanta had lost some 65% of its trees in 20 years. A heat island was expanding steadily from downtown Atlanta to the Hartsfield International Airport. The central city core was at times 6 to 12 degrees warmer than the surrounding suburbs. Trees have a major impact on the climate local climates, urban climates. When you cut down trees, you cut down green spaces and put up parking lots and roadways, you end up increasing the temperature by anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees. 
And that hot temperature really has a lot of negative impacts, both climatically, it has a negative impact on people's health, and it also hurts the environment in terms of air quality because it affects the chemical reactions that occur. Typically, when the cities are being developed, the very first thing that people do, they chop down the trees and orchards and replace them with impermeable surfaces that most of them are dark, either rooftops or pavements. And uh, this uh, temperature difference between the city and the suburban rural area is defined as the heat island. Atlanta's Olympic ring was in the red-hot center of the temperature grid. Higher temperatures were contributing to increasing smog, ozone, and air pollution. The impact of deforestation is being felt far beyond the city's borders, affecting entire regions. The loss of trees reduces the amount of carbon dioxide that can be absorbed. Worldwide, scientists detect an alarming rise in CO2 levels and global warming. One of the ways they have man is having an effect on the environment is burning more and more fossil fuel. This fossil fuel, which is burned, would show up in the form of the uh, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. That CO2 acts like a blanket, a thermal blanket around the globe. Atlanta and the state of Georgia has spent something on the order of a billion dollars in the last 10 years or so to clean up our air pollution problems, and we haven't made any progress. Um, that is not a, a record that we're proud of. The obstacles, of course, are the development pressure. There's a huge amount of development pressure here. Everybody wants to live in Atlanta because it's such a lovely place, and they don't realize that the place that they want to live in is going to be destroyed by all the, the new housing and the new buildings that are coming in. Atlanta is not alone. In 1987 and 1991, American forests surveyed the condition of street trees in 20 cities. Many of the cities were planting far fewer trees than where they were removing. Many of them were not even inventorying what they had, so they really didn't know how bad conditions were. In many cities, maintenance funds are cut. The problem is that there are a fixed number of dollars available and we have police and fire that are really considered very important in any community. And we've been faced with ongoing budget cuts for the city as a whole. So in that environment, it's been very difficult for us to get more money to do more tree work. Some say reduced funding has forced many city foresters to become nothing more than undertakers for dead and dying trees. The lack of maintenance has made the trees vulnerable to disease and infestation. In New York, the Asian beetle is sweeping through communities, wreaking devastation not unlike that of Dutch elm disease. These plots in Brooklyn are all that remain of an entire street of trees. I just couldn't picture a backyard without that tree. It's my granddaughter who is like, knew that I was going to be devastated when this happened because I just kept talking, they're going to take our tree down. And I was really upset. My granddaughter wrote me a note saying, don't be sad, don't be sad. And my husband said, I used to say, when that tree goes, I go with it. Nationwide, citizens are grappling with the effects of a changing landscape. With changing land use patterns, there will be conflict. Um, uh, a lot of different conflicts. There's going to be more people and not less with greater demands on a diminishing base of resources. With development has come conflict over competing needs. I think there are issues as to how much green space do we need? Um, how effectively will it offset the impacts associated with economic development as this community grows? How can this green space be best configured and managed to, to provide net benefit? In 
In some cities, the utility lines have proved to be a battleground. One of the most tragic things is the uh, desecration of a live oak. A live oak can be trimmed to canopy up over lines. It doesn't have to have a whole uh, cut in, in it or a crotch cut or any of the very severe pruning practices that you see today. Natural cycles are disrupted. Trees are not replenished. Raw materials end up as waste. Or there is flooding and water pollution. We're seeing serious problems in allowing too much development, too near floodways, uh, allowing the development of too much impervious surface, you know, concrete, pavement, buildings, things that don't allow the water to percolate through the soil, consequently forcing more water into our waterways, causing the rivers to flood more often, and suddenly those 100-year floods are happening a lot more than once a century. About 44,000 trees have gone down in one development alone. And when you realize that we've planted, it's taken us seven years to plant 10,000 trees, and they took down that many trees in three months, you know, it, it, um, it's just a significant uh, impact on the ecosystem in that area. And all of the wildlife that, that's supported by the, uh, by the trees is forced into, um, into other areas. It interrupts innumerable um, patterns that are intimately related to each other in terms of our whole environmental existence. We can't live without air and water, nor can any other creature. And yet we are destroying the, the primary um, mechanism to clean our water and provide the oxygen for us to breathe. In Atlanta, the conflicts involve the billboard industry. The billboard industry sees trees as vegetation that gets in the way of delivering their message to their client paying customers. And many of them have no qualms at all about cutting down trees so that they can have the billboards visible. It's all done uh, very quietly, and a lot of it happens at night, so nobody knows how it happened, and there's no smoking gun lots of times. It's an ongoing difficulty for all of us. You know, most of our existence as a species, we lived out in the woods or in the savannas. And, uh, and it's only in the last couple hundred years that we've decided to, to live in cities. And I don't think you can cut, or, you, you can cut the human uh, off from nature and say, well, it's not going to have any consequences. One city began to look for solutions. In Chicago, the mayor and political leaders called for a study of the city's street trees. It came to be called the Chicago Urban Forest Climate Project. It came to uh, fruition uh, primarily because we'd done a, a study in Dayton, Ohio in the early 1980s uh, where we looked at the role of vegetation and trees in modifying the climate and air pollution levels of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Mayor Daly and his staff learned of that study and asked if uh, my staff and I would conduct a three-year, uh, $1 million study of the city of Chicago's urban forest ecosystem. This was the first time we really focused on one city, particularly of that size and that complexity, uh, for a period of time with, with reasonably adequate resources. We looked at uh, meteorology, air quality, carbon, energy, costs and benefits, and tried to wrap it all together into uh, the physical ecosystem understanding of that. They found that the benefits of trees were larger than anyone had imagined. The role of vegetation in an urban system ranges from uh, air cleansing uh, through energy conservation, through reducing peak runoffs during storm events, uh, into the very important uh, visual and perceptual and social aspects of a community. In areas that there was high tree cover, you could get up to 5 and 10 percent short-term air quality improvements. Air pollution was reduced. Temperatures dropped. The amount of smog declined. Trees absorbed water, reducing stormwater drainage. The benefits from those trees were 
nearly two and a half times greater than the costs associated with the planting and management of those trees. City officials have become dedicated to improving the inner city environment. They realize that not everybody can or should move to the suburbs. And the urban forest helps encourage people to stay in town. In Sacramento, similar results were found. Six million trees provide about $64 million worth of benefits every year. And even though that's a substantial amount, um, it's really modest when you consider the impact that we're having on our environment. Trees can make a big difference to the quality of life in, in urban areas. Um, they modify the microclimate of our environments. They clean our air. Um, they reduce flooding and, and rainfall runoff. They protect our soil from erosion. They just contribute to the quality of our environment and the quality of our life in many, many ways. This chart tells us there's $12 million in value, in replacement value of the urban forest. This City planners and public work officials in Sacramento took to this rather quickly, this being urban forest science technical inf information that the urban forest does make a difference if there's investments, if there's planting, if there's care, if there's, if there's management. And that's principally because Sacramento has, is striving to become the best city possible. Last year, the city took its first public opinion survey ever, and trees just came right off the top as the most important thing to the uh, citizens of Sacramento. At the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, Hashim Akbari has found that tree planting and light color surfacing can contribute in a major way to cool cities. By all means, shade trees appear to be one of the lowest uh, energy efficiency, low cost energy efficiency measure that uh, exists. The pay, typical payback that we expect for trees is to be something less than uh, one to two years. Others have begun to measure how trees might affect social conditions in a community and social health. A study was undertaken at the Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago. Well, Robert Taylor Homes is the largest public housing development in the world. 28 high-rise buildings uh, over uh, from 21st Street to 55th Street, concentrated uh, poverty uh, and high hopes. Some of the buildings have quite a number of trees, or, or a fair number of trees, right next to the buildings. And then you walk down a little bit further, and you'll notice there's not only are there no trees, but there's hardly any grass or any green space at all. It's really a concrete jungle. When I first came to Robert Taylor, there was more trees and grass, benches, you know, more grown-ups downstairs, a lot of you know, parents and children, now that they have took the grass away, added concrete, took the playground material away, there's less adults down, and there's young kids, but they have nothing to play on. When you feel depressed, you come out and look at the concrete. Nothing, no flowers, no grass. Sometimes it's a warm day, and it feels, you know, just depressing. Before we started our research, I would have said, Hmm, it's nice, you know, trees are nice, but our, the problems we're facing in our cities and our budgets are such that I'm not sure it's worth it. And I think that through this research I've become convinced that, no, it, trees are really an important part of a so, supportive, humane environment. Without, without vegetation, people, aren't, people are very different beings. People that live in intense poverty have to count on their neighbors for a lot of the social support that they need in their lives. We're finding that trees produce settings in which neighbors get to know each other better and violence is reduced. Therefore, trees are associated with the reduction of one of our most significant, important public policy concerns of the day. The 
trees give you and grass give you more life. You feel, you know, the breeze, it just vibrates through. You feel calmer. Trees have to do with beauty and aesthetic, an appreciation of life, and a capacity to see growth. And we hope that the trees are a metaphor for the kind of growth that we're going to see in the families and in the individuals that live here. The environment sets up a sense of place. I think it has a tremendous psychological impact on people in the environment. So I, I think we've just touched the top of the iceberg as far as what trees do to us psychologically uh, and what they do to us environmentally and what they do to us physically, how they can modify climates and, and, and sequester carbon dioxide, clean the air, slow the waters. We hear this story so much, but we need to, we need to keep it up because Political management needs to hear that story so that they understand that trees pay and they don't cost. Robert Schiero was part of a model tree program in Milwaukee where trees came to be at the center of city planning, not an add-on at the end. One of the most important things in planting a tree is not at the time of planting, it is the plan that allows the space both underground and overhead and then the compatible tree that is set up by the forestry people that will fit into that site. So the site has to be prepared and the tree has to be engineered into the site so they both fit and complement themselves. The right tree in the right place is going to cost you 2.2% of the entire construction project for that road. But planting is only the beginning. Milwaukee places a great deal of emphasis on maintaining the trees it plants. We can plant the tree, but we can't walk away from it. When we plant that tree, we expect that tree to be there 60 years. And that means that you have to set up a dedicated funding source so that that tree will be pruned and maintained in a proper manner so that it will perform maximum performance with minimum liability. Funding source for maintenance, funding source for maintenance, because that is the key. Today, scientific knowledge is in hand, and model programs have been created, but ironically, cutbacks have become the order of the day. Austin's city forester turned to the local community for support. Austin is a, is a fairly new city in terms of its population. About half the people who live here are live, lived here less than, than 10 years, and we don't have a traditional you know, tax and spend sort of mentality in Texas. Uh, taxes are low, there's no uh, business tax, there's no income tax at the city and state level. So uh, we don't have a lot of money to provide the direct services like they do in other areas of the country. But along with that sort of philosophy of not having much money, there's also a philosophy that people have that when they want to get something done, they go out and do it. They help each other, sort of the frontier mentality. They have developed model tree replanting programs at a fraction of the cost faced by other communities. And that idea of, of government as acting as a facilitator as opposed to a direct provider has been a very, very powerful concept in Austin and, and one that we've mined pretty heavily. And the way that we do that is we know which areas of town have low canopy cover or need trees, and we know what trees do very well, and we have a local dry cleaner who will pay us uh, to buy the trees that we need to plant along the streets, and then we go to the individual homeowners and say, would you like a tree in your front yard? And we actually mark a spot in their front yard where they can plant a tree. We leave a little door hanger and they tear the card off the door hanger, send it back to us and say, yes, I'd like to plant a tree there and this is the kind of tree I want. We order the trees, the local dry cleaner pays for the trees. We drop the trees off at the people's house and they plant and water them. So the big expenses in, in tree planting, which are to buy the trees to plant them and water them, are overcome. So in the past three years, we've planted about 10,000 trees 
and an average taxpayer cost of about $6 each, and a total cost per tree of about $25 each. But elsewhere, others feel the government must be more involved. Well, the funding for urban forestry research uh, uh, is inadequate uh, because of the complexity of the uh, system that we're studying, because of the fact that we're on a steep part of the learning curve, and because not everyone fully understands uh, the science of urban forest ecosystem analysis and how it can be applied very quickly and in a leveraged way to produce large public benefits. We're just beginning to understand how urban ecosystems function. We're really just at the cusp of, of even learning how to study them. This fraxinus is 63. This side's going to fill in. Some of these branches are going to grow foliage over this way. Yeah, it made it pretty one-sided, you know. Urban forestry uh, became an issue at universities in the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, so that would be about when, the, when these uh, courses were first taught. Uh, at, at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, uh, we started our program in 1973, and uh, with teach, the teaching of a course in urban forestry, and then within a few years, we developed an undergraduate program in urban forestry. In recent years, uh, it's been much more recognized. Uh, early on, I think rural foresters tended to think of urban forestry as, as something that, uh, that they didn't have to deal with. Another such program was established at Southern University in Baton Rouge. We have uh, not only the first uh, BS degree program in urban forestry now, but we also have been recently approved to offer a master's and a PhD in urban forestry, and this truly would be uh, the cream of the crop uh, for urban forestry in the nation academically. Now we're getting down to that way. That clay does. Yeah. The students from these programs have already begun to be involved at the community level. Elsewhere, leaders of youth programs have discovered the vital role of wilderness and working in the out of doors. In Chicago, the river rats were formed. We all went over to an area about half a mile from here on the Chicago River, and the young people called it the Amazon. The kids started adopting the name river rats because they were down there cleaning up. They brought over nine or 10 tons of garbage up out of that site. These studies and community programs have received some support, but only a small percentage of cities receive help. Others have felt the government should do more. Some in the U.S. Forest Service agreed. We began to realize the significance of the urban forest in so many different uh, dimensions and started looking more towards a, an ecosystem or a more holistic view. So it's been a matter of broadening of, uh, of our approach. People are still moving from the city to the suburbs and so forth to find different types of environments, but we're seeing a great deal more emphasis on improving the inner city environment. We have experienced a certain degree of political support over the last 10 years, and it's produced significant results nationwide. Uh, but I think there could be more. You know, a doubling of that effort uh, would probably have a, a quantum increase in the amount of impact. And there was a group of us who were concerned that uh, street trees and urban parks and, uh, and open space wasn't getting adequate attention, that, that those resources were declining, that they were being impacted by disease and human use and pollution, and that they uh, required some attention because 80% of all Americans live in, in cities and, and, and metropolitan areas. This support has come none too soon for many ordinary citizens. In Los Angeles, dense smog was killing even the trees in the mountains. Andy Lipkiss began planting trees and launched a formal organization called Tree People. The reason why Tree People is one word is because it implies that joining hands uh, together, working together with each other, with the trees, is really where it all begins. Okay. Right. In Baton Rouge, great tracts of green space were being cut down. A group of citizens, about 12 people, got together. They were very concerned about the changes that were occurring in the urban forest and the lack of planning from the city government. So they 
decided that if there was going to be something done to alleviate that, they would have to do it themselves. Atlanta had become a treeless maze of concrete. By the time Trees Atlanta came into existence in 1985, we had almost no trees downtown. So now we're trying hard to restore some of that. In Sacramento, severe budget cuts in 1981 led the mayor and citizens like Ray Tretheway to establish the Sacramento Tree Foundation. Tree planting was not, of, uh, uh, was not on the agenda for county planning. City and, and county planners and public work officials, department heads, have only recently been acquainted with the technical scientific benefits of our, our, our urban forests. In New York City, the Environmental Action Coalition was formed. Open space and trees were not part of the concept of New York. You have extraordinary parks like Prospect and Central. You have huge woodland parks in the northern Bronx. And then you have neighborhood after neighborhood with almost no open space. By the late 1980s, nonprofit groups were being formed in cities and states throughout the country. In 1993, they formed the Alliance for Community Trees. The Alliance for Community Trees is um, a network. It's a nationwide network of not-for-profit groups that work with urban forestry. Right now, we have 43 members. Uh, we are not in all states. We are in 28. We're hoping, eventually, to have about 60 or 70 members and to reach all states with at least one group. The oldest nonprofit and most influential is American Forests, based in Washington, D.C. American Forests has been in the role of organizing the National Urban Forest Conferences since 1982. And at each conference, we try to uh, gather the information that's available in the urban forestry community and the conservation community and, and pick out the most important issues for developing the urban forestry movement. These organizations are part of an expanding movement, and yet they are still struggling just to get recognition of the importance of urban forests. A wall continues to exist between environmentalists and policymakers at the city, state, and federal levels. The science of urban forestry is developing rapidly, yet we still see cutbacks in programs in communities to take care of their trees. And there is a gap, of course, between science and public policy. And that's, uh, to a great extent, what American Forest has been concerned about. How do we communicate this scientific information to people who are making decisions in communities? I've worked with a lot of city administrations over the past 20 years. And I would say that until recently, they have had no, like no, understanding of why green space is important. When many nonprofits began, it wasn't easy. There was no system. Every single hole had to be hand dug. It was a lot of work. In our very intensely developed downtown area, it's hard to put trees along the sidewalks. Our first trees, I think we planted only like 10 trees, and it was a big effort when we got it done. To Andy Lipkiss in Los Angeles, the experience of planting trees was life-changing. Working with people and seeing a dead land come back to life was a powerful inspiration. Baton Rouge Green is working with a local university in the public school system. The Sacramento Tree Foundation works with city officials. I think that nonprofits are in a unique position to be able to help the urban forestry condition by disseminating information, taking this scientific information that we have on all the benefits of trees and putting it before the policymakers. The results can be impressive. The Martin Luther King Boulevard in Los Angeles was transformed in one day. Trees Atlanta expanded. We were planning about, I would say, 
40 trees a year, and then the Olympics hit, and the funding quadrupled. We did, what, $4.5 million worth of trees in the downtown area. We were planting about 1,000 trees a year for the, for the uh, Olympics, and that was really a lot of moving and a lot of actions, and we're still carrying on that, that momentum right now. New York citizens began working with school children. And when we took them out to kind of do tree work and identify trees and kind of get close to trees, I realized, you know, we'd tapped into something more powerful than anything we ever dreamed. The Chicago River Rats have transformed the lives of former gang members and their families. I see young people involved in this project who say things such as, you know, before I started working on this project, I'd walk by trees and I'd walk by flowers and I'd not really pay that much attention. But all of a sudden, things like trees become more important to me and families become involved and it's just a snowball effect. And I certainly see that happening here and it's an exciting thing to see happen. When young people are involved in gardens, then it all of a sudden goes up generationally and their parents come out and say, what's going on out here? And they see what's happening. I think it has shown uh a togetherness of the community around here because they see what we're doing and some people they like to volunteer their hours around here and help out and once you get to talking to them they really um, seem interested in nature and that's a way that we've been able to help the community and they, um, they're very concerned about this project. It's just like a place where you can come and see a lot of green and it you know makes you feel good to know that you helped you know your neighborhood out for making this a better place. We are forest creatures, and uh, we can't live without the forest. I mean, you don't plant a tree for today, you plant it for the future. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, a thing that people do that can give them hope in their community. The work of nonprofits and community groups has been important, but the management of the urban forest, say many scientists, is more than a volunteer job. It will require a team effort of government, business, and citizens. I think when we think of the urban forest, we think of trees and you know, being solid and permanent and long-lived. But in fact, the urban forest is really a very fragile resource. We can um, look at what happened to our communities with Dutch elm disease and how all of a sudden the forest was decimated. Um, we can look at the impact of hurricanes and removal of large numbers of trees and realize that that resource can disappear in a very short period of time. I think people need nature. It, it's not going to be worth the effort to live in a city if, if, if I can't have something green around me, if I can't go out and hear birds, uh, if I can't have some piece of nature available to me. You know, it, it's not going to be a very interesting life. All of humankind has its roots tied directly to the land, and, and that's an inescapable truth. And I think the further we get removed from it, the more disconnected we are, the less functional we are. We become more dysfunctional. And that's really the final analysis. When, when you're thinking of an ecosystem, you're really a community. All of this stuff, this nature, is an extension of our community. We're really not that far removed from the land. Uh, we just have to remind ourselves of that. Urban forestry is in a key position to do great things for the future. We have the science. We have the people now that have degrees in urban forestry. I don't know particularly what cultivar this one is. There's still a long way to go. All we have to do is want to do it. America, said Olmsted, was the one country where democracy made trees and parklands available to everyone. Here, nature was not merely the soil. It was the fountain of energy that flowed through and gave diversity to American life. And as we are now discovering, protected the very biological processes on which we depend.
Today, the fate of the forest falls increasingly to cities where the vast majority of Americans live. For more information on the forest where we live, visit us online. Set your browser to www.lpb.org. This has been a production of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Funding for the forest where we live was provided in part by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service in cooperation with the National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council.